Good morning, everybody. My name is Patty Torsney, and I'm the permanent observer for the Interparliamentary Union here in New York. And uh, my uh, colleague, Alessandra Motter, is on uh, the call as well. You can see him there. Um, Alessandro conceived of this idea of having a series of six briefings a year on various aspects of the United Nations. I uh, have Alessandro Motter and Sandrine uh, uh, Gigon um, helping out with this meeting, and we're very pleased to have all of you join us for this briefing. The second briefing is reviewing the UN peace building architecture. And as all of you know, 70, 75, whoops, we've lost Oscar. Uh, 75 years ago, the United Nations uh, was uh, created to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. But of course, peace means more than just the absence of war. And in 2005, the Peace Building Commission was established to address the underlying drivers of conflict and to support the conditions for lasting peace in countries emerging from conflict. I'm very pleased that we have a broad range of participants from around the world, uh, some of who know this issue very well, um, and that we are uh, able to welcome Oscar Taranko, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support. Um, Oscar is a, a great friend to the Interparliamentary Union um, and has uh, worked in for over 30 years at the United Nations in a variety of uh, capacities. Um, Oscar, without further ado, I will turn to you and ask you to speak for about five to eight minutes, uh, explaining the peace building architecture and, uh, and what is going on and what is the state of affairs so that we can review that architecture and provide a parliamentary perspective as well. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Patty, and good morning to everybody. It's a very big pleasure to be part of this briefing. And let me start by thanking IPU and the many uh, uh, MPs that are present in today's uh, discussion, your interest in the subject matter. Uh, it's a good opportunity uh, for us in the UN to be able to strengthen the bonds of collaboration and partnership. Uh, IPU is a friend of peace building, avant la lettre, uh, having continuously promoted parliamentary diplomacy and dialogue between and societies with the aim of resolving conflict without war. And IPU was an early and strong supporting of the uh, Sustaining Peace concept with a resolution adopted in March of 2018 on sustaining peace as a vehicle, as a vehicle for achieving sustainable development. I'm also very pleased to acknowledge the presence of my good friends and colleagues, Ambassador Liberata Mulalu Mula, who was part of the Independent Eminent Persons Group that advised the Secretary General during the review of the peace building architecture as well as uh, Ambassador Jacqueline O'Neill, who's also a very regular and frequent briefer on women, peace and security matters and empowering of women. So really it's, it's a big honor to be part of this panel. And I think this is actually a very timely discussion in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic, given the devastating impact that this is having and which is sparing no country or society. This pandemic actually represents a significant risk to our efforts to sustain peace and security around the world. And this has been the object of many uh, peace building commission meetings, as well as the Security Council. Uh, polarization is on the rise, fueled by unchecked information, which spreads through social media. Hate speech and other forms of incitement have become further entrenched. Great power competition and regional rivalries have increased undermining international cooperation. So all this will surely occupy many parliamentarians as well. The notion that the social contract between the state and the people is further eroding and eroding quite fast. This combined development means that our work in peace building will become both more essential while at the same time much more challenging. The peace building architecture has been evolving over the past years to be fit for purpose and it will need to continue to prove its worth as we move forward. But before moving to the issues of the architecture, maybe a few points on the rationale on peace building and sustaining peace. Um, the Secretary General Guterres made prevention his absolute priority when he assumed his office in 2017. Peace building has been an instrumental part of that prevention effort. 
and it is no longer treated as a post-conflict activity, but rather a priority in all the stages of the conflict, before, during, and after. The importance of this was marked in 2016, when the Security Council and the General Assembly, in a unique moment, passed twin identical resolutions, coining the phrase and the term of sustaining peace. These resolutions highlight that at the center of the UN's efforts is to build and sustain peace, is this need to promote a truly whole of society approach. And this is also means addressing the cross-cutting uh, conflict drivers of inequality, climate change, job scarcity, competition over land resources, corruption, transnational crime, exclusion of women and young people, among many others. So what is the peace building architecture? This was created back in 2005 during the then SG Kofi Annan uh, to address a gaping hole, as it was called at the time. The peace building architecture is actually a three-legged stool at its core, which comprises the peace building commission, the peace building fund, and the peace building support office. And both in 2015 and 29, uh, 2019, the General Assembly and the Security Council requested reviews of this architecture and the role of peace building in the entire system. So let me start by quickly describing each one of these key components. The Peace Building Commission. It is a 31 member uh, intergovernmental platform and it, it's increasing playing a vital and active bridging, convening, advocacy and advisory role to in the intergovernmental system. So this intergovernmental platform provides advisory services to the Security Council, ECOSOC, and the General Assembly. It has country and region specific meetings that are convened at the request of the member states. Again, with the, with the focus of the work of the commission, which is to promote national ownership and inclusivity. The commission has been broadening its engagement with many more countries and regions, as well as with in thematic areas like addressing issues of women, peace and security, youth, peace and security, climate security linkages. And interesting, this is the only UN intergovernmental body that actually has adopted a gender strategy, which it actually promotes and monitors and enhances. It is now developing a youth in peace and security uh, strategy as well. So uh, the role to the Security Council has been very much enhanced, I would say, over the past four years, um, between 2016 and 2019. For example, the Commission provided advice to the Security Council in at least 50 occasions. And the importance of this advice is that it treats, it seeks to expand, if you will, the, 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 the advice to link development issues with peace and security issues, with human rights issues, and links uh, to humanitarian response issues. Uh, in particular, the advice of the Peace Building Commission has very much been appreciated in the context of peacekeeping, mandate renewals, or during the transition out of either peacekeeping or special political missions. And there's a lot of examples, we don't have time to go into them. Let me go then to the Peace Building Fund. So this Peace Building Fund, which is called the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund, is a unique UN financial instrument of first recourse, actually to go very quickly and support countries that are in transitions or at risks or being affected by conflict. The fund is meant to enhance the collaboration across the pillars of the UN, development, peace and security, human rights, and the humanitarian response. And what it does is promotes integrated, integrated UN responses to peace building opportunities. It helps catalyze, but it helps to leverage additional funding from other financial sources. And this is particularly important in the context of conflict uh, or effect or fragile states. Um, it is also an instrument that is very risk tolerant and so takes a lot of initiative in sensitive areas where usually many donor, uh, you know, development partners would be quite hesitant to actually uh, get involved in. It has been a unique instrument to ease the transitions between UN configurations, peacekeeping political missions to the presence of UN country teams. And again, it incentivizes agencies, funds and programs to work collaboratively together to strengthen national capacities, both at the central level, at the local level. Um, 
what else can I say? That the PDF actually invests uh, with UN entities, but also with governments, regional organizational, uh, regional organization, national uh, multi-donor trust funds that might be set up, civil society organizations. So it has a very flexible way of being able to partner with different organizations to actually bring the relevant stakeholders to work together on concrete uh, initiatives. And uh, since uh, you know it was established as one of the most uh, widely, broadly subscribed UN funds that there is, there's over 60 member states that have contributed voluntarily to it since its establishment. We have already dispersed some $1.5 billion since this fund was established and a new uh, strategic plan was just approved and just to say very briefly that the focus of this new strategic plan trying to mobilize an additional 1.5 billion dollars over the next five years will be uniquely focused on encouraging and promoting women's empowerment youth participation cross-border collaboration between countries helping the transitions and again a unique instrument to provide support to peace agreements to national dialogues reconciliation efforts transitional justice and these type of, of work. So the reason I'm going a little bit into details is because national parliaments play a huge role in influencing how member states contribute to the work of the UN. And I think here IPU is uniquely placed to respond to the Secretary General's repeated calls for a quantum leap in contribution to this particular instrument of his, given the scarcity and rarity of funds. The Peace Building Support Office is the third leg. It has been strengthened with the recent reforms with the establishment of a new department called the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs. So the former DPA and the former PBSO have been merged into one department. And this actually to provide better integration and a more holistic approach to link mediation, political analysis, conflict, uh, identification of conflict drivers with the mechanisms that allow the UN to actually support member states and the stakeholders in addressing those uh, conflict drivers. Um, the review then, because this is part of what uh, Patty asked me to, to sort of, you know, come in, what's going on in terms of the review of this peace building architecture. So it's important to know that this architecture is reviewed every five years. And one of the most important elements of this year's review was the uh, request of the member states to focus on how much progress there has been since the passage of the 2016 resolution on, on peace building and sustaining peace. And I think the Secretary General's report, which I think was one of the background documents for this meeting, actually points to a tremendous amount of progress that has happened not just within the UN as a result of the reforms of the Secretary General, but also among member states to become much more coherent, more coordinated, and more focused on this issue of peace building and sustaining peace. Uh, important also has been the development of new partnership agreements, in particular with regional organizations. And I would say that in the case of Africa, the work that has increased with the African Union, ECOWAS, SADC, etc., has been on the rise and so these joint efforts around uh, peace building has been very much strengthened as has been the relationship say with the international financial institutions like the world bank so again what are the opportunities uh, in terms of of um, of further increasing effectiveness i think maybe in past meetings you might have heard that the world bank has also uh, been adapting and changing its lens uh, to implement uh, the fragility, conflict, and violence strategy that they have. So this is an institution with a lot of resources, the IDA-19, that has something like $18 billion, that is increasingly being uh, allocated to address issues of fragility and conflict drivers in some of the, uh, in, in some of the member states. Uh, opportunities to work much closer with the IMF. Um, to ensure that we are increasingly all working to ensure that young women, young people, marginalized communities are consistently included in peace processes and political decision making. And then this actually extremely important in, in terms of accessing social services, establishing inclusive institutions and sustain efforts again to foster social cohesion. Um, one of the key aspects that has come out of this review is the, 
is, is a common problem that has existed since the establishment of the architecture, which is the lack of adequate, predictable, and sustained financing for peace building. This is usually an afterthought. It is never seen as something that needs to be done to prevent violent conflict from happening. And the reason this is important, that is, if you see what how much uh, funding has gone to humanitarian responses, to peacekeeping operations, to special political missions. This goes in the hundreds of billions of dollars that could have been averted had we included a conflict sensitive lens to many of the development policies that many national governments are implementing. So I think extremely important has been that in the review, there's a renewed focus on the importance of financing, on the importance of partnership, on the importance of inclusivity, and on the importance of national ownership of these peace building um, you know, frameworks. And so let me just end with what you, IPU, can do for us, because I, uh, you know, this is a unique opportunity to, uh, to address to decision makers here. Um, let me just, you know, you, you, you are, as it is, uh, you know, staunch supporters of inter-society diplomacy, dialogue, and peace building. So what can we do? How can we work together better? The first and foremost is the support that you can uh, actually do in with your respective governments towards achieving this adequate predictable and sustained financing for peace building um, we need to switch much more to prevention rather than to response uh, response gets the media and gets the media clip a humanitarian response but, but it's much more difficult to engage in the type of work that ipu has been engaging which is preventing conflict from happening in the first place. The second, so again, it's important because prevention works, it saves lives and resources, and it's cost effective. We have done a joint analysis of this with the World Bank. It's a report called Pathways for Peace. It's a good reading for many parliamentarians because this is the business case for financing of peace building that would make your arguments in parliament. And the second is again, the fact that the Secretary General has been over the past months emphasizing the importance of getting to a reimagined social contract that gives everybody equal access, opportunity, dignity, a stake in society, and a say in the decisions that affect their lives, regardless of age, gender, or diversity. In many countries, as a result of these rising inequalities and now the pandemic, the erosion of the social contract is evident, and this affects peace building and sustaining peace. And here, I believe that jointly IPU and the UN can work much closer together in strengthening and revigorizing the social contract. So thank you, Patty. And sorry, I went, might have gone a few minutes over. Thanks. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, it was a terrific briefing, a, a lot of information there. And you mentioned a specific report that uh, MPs might be interested in reading. And so perhaps you can, uh, we will get that and put it in the chat as well. You also mentioned our next two presenters, of course. And uh, we're very pleased that Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula, uh, who is a member of the group of independent eminent persons on peace building. She's also a, a, a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Tanzania and the first executive secretary of the International Conference on the Great Lakes region. So lots of experience there and we will be looking forward to hearing her comments on their work, the eminent person's work on peace building uh, architecture review. Over to you. Uh, we just need to unmute. There you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say good, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good night, maybe, because I'm sure with the wider uh, participants uh, with, in different time zones, uh, I'm speaking from Tanzania, so it's, it's evening here. That's why I said good, good evening. Uh, I, I must say I'm honored and I'm uh, very much pleased to participate in this briefing for members of parliament on this UN Peace Building Architecture Review. I thank you for the kind invitation, IPU, but um, I also thank my good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Oscar Taranko, 
who has just spoken has made my work easy because um, I was my task easy because I was saying in five minutes, what do you say? <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy that uh, he has covered most of the areas. But I must also thank you, IPU, uh, for convening this virtual briefing and discussions uh, because um, of course, I was, um, I've been invited as a member of the independent eminent persons. Yeah, but, but during the eight months, we were consulting the stakeholders, the interlocutors, the civil society, the women, the youth, the NGOs, of course, all the UN entities. We had a missing link. We never had the opportunity to speak to the members of parliament. <laughs> So I, I am glad that you have given us this opportunity at a time when the Secretary General is submitting his report. And of course, after submission comes the most important stage is implementation. And this is where the members of parliament become very critical in ensuring that uh, the report and the recommendations that are put to the member states are fully implemented. So I am saying in the short time I've been given, uh, I will not attempt to cover all avenues of peace building, which we tackled as a uh, independent eminent persons. Uh, I'll just give um, some highlights on what were the major preoccupation during the, the time of our, our mandate. So, sorry, sorry, I'm lost. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> because I thought I went off. Yeah. So uh, as, as I was saying, I just wanted to put the in the context of the mandate of the independent eminent persons in which capacity have been invited to participate in this consultation process. But also, I would like to start by quoting the one of the women I adore most. This is Noreen Hazel, who was the then executive director of UNIFEM. It was then known in United Nations Development Fund for Women, as was known then. In 1999, she said, a world of sustainable peace, a world without war, is too heavy a burden to be left in the hands of any one institution, government, or gender. So this is by bringing the members of parliament, this is a recognition that is not the government cannot, cannot do it alone, the United Nations cannot do it alone. The women cannot do it alone. So this is an inclusive uh, approach is what I, in fact, uh, advised our work. So let me say our mandate emanated from the, what they call the twin resolutions that were adopted by the General Assembly and the Security Council in 2016 on peace building and sustaining peace. And uh, they made their goal was to build a common vision of a society ensuring that the needs of four segments of the population are taken into account. It also required the UN to take a comprehensive and cross-pillar and, in and inclusive approach and to closely coordinate with local actors and align its work with national priorities. These resolutions also emphasize that sustaining peace is a shared task and responsibility that needs to be fulfilled by the government and other national stakeholders. And that the scale and nature of the challenge of sustaining peace can be met through cross um, stra uh, strategic and operational partnerships between national governments, the United Nations, and the other key stakeholders, including, of course, also the parliaments, the youth organization, the women groups, and the other relevant uh, sectors of the society. So in, with that in view, the Secretary General then um, decided to appoint a small group of um, eminent persons. I don't know that we are eminent, but then he was able to bring us together to bring in our various experiences to help him look into this uh, uh, peace building architecture. And when we started, and it's from what Oscar has explained, we realized that um, the building was there, the, the architecture was built, but then what needed to be done? And uh, this has also, as Oscar said, after every five years, there have always been a review. So we were not uh, there to dismantle the building. 
but see how it can be refurbished, how it, you can create uh, uh, harmony, you can create, uh, you are, look at the house, that the house that are, the rooms that are in coherent manner. So this is what we said, we are not going to like reinventing the wheel, but let's see where we can improve. So the approach we used was uh, of course to take stock of what progress that has been made since the last review, but also take into account the context of the ongoing reforms of the UN, because uh, with the Secretary General Guterres, there have been so many reforms that have been undertaken, and as explained by us, how this peace building architecture has been put together, harmonized, so we took note of that. But then we also realized that there were many areas that required improvement moving forward on peace building, of course, with emphasis on implementation at the field level. And this is where the members of parliament come in, because uh, every time there's a review, it's always looking at the UN uh, organs, the architecture, but forgetting that whatever is decided at that, at that level, the impact is seen at the field level. And this is where we put our focus. So we engaged many stakeholders, as I mentioned at the beginning, leaving no one behind. We had the NGO, the think tanks, because also the UN entities, the academic institutions. We reviewed a number of, um, of documents. And um, of course, um, with the aim of uh, producing an outcome that would add value to this uh, ongoing uh, review. So let me and highlight that uh, the, the issue of the humanitarian development peace nexus became a, a very prominent in our discussion and we looked at it in great detail. Uh, of course, Oscar has explained what has been the missing link. We found that although there has been significant progress in, bridge, in bridging humanitarian development gaps since the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, we are concerned that the peace peace was always like an afterthought. And of course also, as he mentioned, a lot of money is put in humanitarian assistance in response to crisis, but not in sustaining peace, investing in sustaining peace, which is the whole, uh, the whole reason, reason that of looking into how you can strengthen the peace building architecture. We also looked, of course, we say, well, we look at the peace building, but also there are some other issues that are always also overlooked like uh, the climate change, the internal displacement, the spillovers of these conflicts. But more importantly, and at the center of this review, or at the center of the, of the resolution, the three resolutions were the issue of inclusivity, which came out prominent in our discussion. The resolution rec recognized the people-centered approaches. And I'm sure with the members of parliament, you know what it means what, when you talk of people-centered. And also, it was also premised on the inclusive national ownership that which we take into regard all segments of societies which were considered as key to both peace building and development sustaining peace. So we recognize that the nexus between maintaining development, peace and development, that it cannot be a conversation that is limited only to the UN and its partners, but that it should be a broader discussion that involves how national and local governments civil society organizations, women groups, private sector, interact in uh, ensuring that uh, we achieve this sustaining sustenance of peace. But this was also, we also discussed it in the context of the, of the 2030s um, sustainable development goals. And also we realized that exclusion has been almost important factor of why peace fails. So that's why there was also a lot of focus on this. And it was also recognized that the UN is not the only actor on the ground. Partnerships were important at the local, national, regional level with a broad, broad range of factors. It was also important to see that uh, in this process of reviewing, to see how you can, the UN can build coalitions, including coalitions with peace builders and parliamentarians. We also believe that uh, the UN's role is to empower these actors and protecting and promoting civic space, which has been shrinking. So let me say also, as um, uh, Mr. Toranko just mentioned, we also looked at the role, important role of the Peace Building Commission as a big convener and as a platform 
that was established to bridge the gaps or the to liaison with the, the Security Council, but also provide a platform to bring in national and local experiences to the forefront. Most important, we looked at the financing because all this they are predicated on the amount of resources that is being invested in this peace building. Mr. Oscar mentioned about the peace building fund. This has been a catalytic tool in this peace building architecture. But then it is also a fund which has been starved of necessary resources. And this is where we see that the members of parliament attention would like to draw to your attention to that, to be able to succeed in this process, the members of parliament have really to engage and ensure that uh, in uh, approving budgets, there will be many requests, requests from member states to be able to, to increase the envelope of the UN, but also with focus on peace building. And of course, finally, this should have come at the, begin, at the beginning, but I didn't want it to spoil the mood, because as we were meeting, then we just saw, uh, we were hit by the COVID-19. So in fact, all our meetings were virtual. We never got to meet in person. But then I think it was also a wake up call that while this was an health crisis, but it was also a problem, I mean, an issue that was aggravating the, the issues of peace, security, aggravating poverty, inequalities, gender-based violence, while increasing vulnerability by impeding on people's access to resources, and also affecting women and girls. So it is in this context that eminent persons also looked at the issue of the women peace and security agenda, that it should be fully integrated in the work of the Peace Building Commission and in the allocation of the Peace Building Fund on sustainable basis. And that priority measures are taken to economically cushion and protect women against the most severe impacts of this pandemic. I'm glad that we'll have um, the ambassador will be speaking on the agenda of women, peace, and security. Let me not uh, uh, preempt her, as because I'm also a woman, woman in peace active, I mean activist. So I might take another <laughs> hour to talk about this. Thank you very much, and thank you again. I'm looking forward uh, to an interactive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mula Mula. And uh, there was a perfect segue into uh, <laughs> Ambassador O'Neill who is the first ambassador for uh, Women, Peace and Security from Canada. She's been involved for many years in the peace processes in over 15 countries um, and has uh, distinguished herself in places like Colombia, Sudan, Pakistan, and South Sudan. And so we're very pleased to have, from another part of the world, um, in Ottawa, uh, to have Jackie O'Neill with us. Jackie, you have about eight minutes. Thanks, uh, Patty, and thanks, Ambassador, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Patty, it is always great to engage with a fellow Canadian. And I know that there are several Canadian parliamentarians who are joining, including from my home province of Alberta and from Western Canada. So special greetings. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, I'll focus on the, the Peace Building Commission, but also more broadly on some of the other dynamics that we're seeing across the UN right now. I'd love to give an hour to Ambassador Mula Mula uh, but I'll, I'll summarize just a few very briefly. Uh, so Canada is currently the chair of the Peace Building Commission, and we've been really proud of our time as chair and, and what we've been able to contribute to. And my colleagues have been quite deeply involved in the 2020 review process to date, and will continue to work through that vehicle. Um, but of course, peace building as a concept and prevention is not intended to live only in the Peace Building Commission and the related fund. And so as Canada's ambassador for women, peace and security, and <laughs> perhaps a non-eminent person, um, I just want to speak to a few of the dynamics related to women, to gender, and to inclusion that are occurring across the UN right now that I think are very important for parliamentarians around the world to be aware of. So last month was the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325, which was the foundation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And that was the first time that the Security Council recognized that women are not just victims of armed conflict, but are agents of change and have to be included in all aspects to prevent and end and rebuild after armed conflict. And so we've had a lot of progress. There are now 10 resolutions total. We have 86 or seven now countries with national action plans on women, peace and security. 
And we have a lot of research that reinforces, as Oscar was talking about, it's in a way the business case. So peace processes that meaningfully include women are 35% more likely to endure at least 15 years. The single biggest predictor of whether a nation goes to war with itself or with its neighbors, it's not its GDP, it's not its region of the world, it's how women are treated. And in the, in the first five years since Resolution 1325, we had about 15% of Security Council resolutions that made explicit references to women, peace and security. In the last two and a half years, that proportion has risen to 70%. So we have a lot more attention on the issue. Yet what I wanna emphasize is this. Many people who have supported that progress are now in a very defensive position of having to simply protect those gains uh, because they are under threat. And we've seen this in various ways. So most recently and significantly at the Security Council a few weeks ago, uh, Russia was chairing in the month of October, and that includes an annual debate on women, peace, and security, and put forward a resolution. So for context, nine out of 10 of the last Security resolution, Council resolutions on women, peace, and security have passed unanimously. Uh, in the one example, Russia and China abstained. Uh, and there were many countries from, uh, concerns from countries that the draft that was put forward didn't advance uh, anything related to women, peace, and security, but actually represented a regression. So for example, there were no strong references to civil society's role in the implementation of women, peace, and security. And that would have been the first resolution ever to be adopted that excluded that language. And countries couldn't resolve the discussion. And so 10 countries on the council abstained and five voted in favor, so it did not pass. So what we saw was an attempt to regress on some of the gains that were already made. And we saw a very concerning narrative that we also really need to take note of, uh, which was some framing that the West was trying to impose frameworks on others. And in reality, all of you know, I hope that this could not be more true. This was not the reality in the negotiations when there was resistance uh, from a number of continents, and it's not reality in terms of how we got women, peace, and security to be an issue of focus. It came from women around the world. It came to the UN through Namibia, from Bangladesh, from Jamaica, women all around the world. And so I think, you know, we just need to, I, I highlight this kind of detailed uh, issue because what is playing out in the Security Council also plays out in other bodies. And as Oscar pointed out, the Peace Building Commission is particularly strong on gender and inclusion. And particularly since 2015, when the last major review was done, the same time that the Youth Peace and Security Resolution occurred and Women, Peace and Security Global Study. And also, as Oscar mentioned, it's the, the first intergovernmental body of the UN to actually have a gender strategy. And what that means in practice is things like having more women come and brief the commission, having briefings from all genders who speak about gender dynamics of a conflict. They can therefore give better advice to other parts of the UN. Uh, and are working on developing, again, as Oscar mentioned, an action plan to keep bringing that to life. And has really been a model, I think, for other parts of the UN that the Peace Building Commission has been. And small example of how this is playing out already, uh, the commission usually pro provides a letter to the council at the time of the annual debate. And of course had a lot of important things to say this year, but members didn't agree on what to include related to gender and, and women, peace and security. So instead of sharing a watered down version, they just let the last text stand and didn't send something else. And I flagged this again, because I think it's important for parliamentarians to be aware of that one, we can't take established gains for granted and think of them as non-negotiable. And we can't let this narrative of the, the West versus the rest get more oxygen because it, again, just could not be further from the truth. And within the women, peace and security sort of community, we really want the focus uh, at the council, at the commission and others to be accepting that we have really strong narrative or normative frameworks and we need to focus on implementing and resourcing those exactly as the ambassador and, and Oscar just described. We have to get uh, fundamental, predictable, and sustainable funding and focus on implementation. So I'll wrap up just by saying that, you know, every significant anniversary of women, peace, and security issues, we say very similar things, which is that women, peace, and security as a concept is about fundamentally preventing armed conflict. 
It's not just making war safer for women, but it's engaging communities that aren't sufficiently represented. And there are enormous benefits in terms of lives spared and resources saved. And every evaluation related to women, peace and security notes that we are not focusing enough on prevention. And that's why we really, really need to support and strengthen the peace building architecture and resource the work of the peace building commission, the fund, et cetera. Uh, to, to allow them to do their work, which in turn supports uh, women and girls around the world. So I'm happy to speak to more in questions, but I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador O'Neill. And uh, I think those are very compelling, uh, in, that's compelling information in terms of the success of the peace process 15 years on by involving women um, in sparing lives and in and saving resources. <clears throat> and certainly when it comes to funding, um, all the participants on this call can foster debates in their own parliaments about the funding that their countries give uh, to the United Nations and, and how that is spent, for sure. Um, and I draw attention to the fact that my colleague Laurence uh, Marzal is also on this call, and she uh, supports the committee within the IPU uh, that does that work as well. Um, we have the first question or comment is from uh, the Swiss member of the um, UN Bureau, UN Committee Bureau of the IPU, Laurent Worley. Merci beaucoup, uh, Paddy. Merci, uh, ainsi que Thank you, Paddy. Thank you, uh, Alexandra and Mrs. Gibbon, for organizing such an interesting uh, meeting. And thank you to the speakers for sharing this information with us. Uh, I, if you allow me, I would like to um, uh, ask a question to Oscar Taranka. You uh, mentioned the partnership between uh, the Peace Building Commission and institutional uh, um, uh, groups such as the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. We have uh, discussed a lot about financial issues, rightly so, but uh, to reinforce some partnership could enable us to pool some financial means instead of just adding them up. But of course, it is not just a question of uh, financing, it is a question of skills. But I would like to have your opinion on that point. Thank you. I'll now turn to the UAE. We have Sarah Falconos. Sarah, are you there? Sarah, if you can yes, unmute. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Hey, thank you very much for this webinar. So my name is Sarah Falconos. I'm a member of the United Arab Emirates Parliament. Um, as a nation, the UAE has played a significant role in promoting peace where it can and around the world. We have recently witnessed history with the peace agreement between the UAE and Israel, where on its own is a game changer in a region truly in need of peace. So my question is for the speakers. How has this pandemic taught us on our ability to have a longer and wider reach to peace building around the world? In a time where we are comfortable to work, meet and do business online, how can we maximize and use this new mean to work to promote peace building efforts and reduce the number of vulnerable victims as a consequence of instability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And I will use this opportunity to remind everybody if they want to put a question or a comment, no, no, no. That, they can do that. Um, I know Ambassador O'Neill uh, put the World Bank study that uh, Oscar referenced there, and I tried to copy and paste so it would come up higher in the chat, and I sent you a completely different link, and I apologize. Um, so go with the one that was sent to you by uh, Ambassador O'Neill. Um, uh, I will turn uh, to the next question, uh, will be uh, Mr. Motter from, Alessandro Motter from the New York office. And I'll remind everyone that on their screen somewhere where they see Chad and reactions and what have you, they will see an interpretation button. So you can choose English or French. Mr. Motter. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is for Mr. Taranko. Um, to put it very simplistically, um, is there a way of quantifying uh, the success rate, if you will, of the peace building commission uh, that operates through so-called country configurations? So a number of countries have been under the purview of the commission over uh, its life. Uh, it would be nice to know how many, roughly. 
uh, and of those, uh, how would you say the commission has actually succeeded in preventing conflict or in restoring the condition for durable peace? And as opposed to countries where you would think uh, there is the situation is still very fragile, and and what might explain, uh, if not the failure, or at least the reason why the commission has not made an impact yet? Thank you. Thank you. I also see uh, 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 Muna Shahib here. I, I see a hand up. Um, I also think you're not on mute. Oh, you seem to be in two screens. So if you could mute your other screen, the one that says Muna, please. Yeah. yeah. Bonjour, Padi. Bonjour, Sadiq. Good morning. Good morning, Alessandro. I would like to thank our experts who enlightened us about the new architecture. I have two questions. We have Munisma in Mali and Munisma in the Western Sahara. The situation in the region is really explosive and that has been worsened by uh, the COVID pandemic which is in a situation where there is an increase of uh, criminality and terrorism. The uh, pandemic could uh, worsen the situation which is already quite worrying in the region with um, consequences for the, the all, uh, all the sectors. So what should be done to face such a situation? Second question, uh, the mission, uh, the conflict in the Western Sahara has always uh, concerned uh, members of the UN. We have the UN mission to uh, bring peace in that region in 1991. A ceasefire was signed under the auspices of the United Nations by the parts to the conflict. And there was also the mission to organize a referendum in the Western Sahara. On the 13th of November 2020, the ceasefire agreement was broke because of um, the intervention of the Moroccan uh, army. And the situation is so serious that it could endanger the uh, peace. So what will be the strategy to avoid uh, the um, uh, worsening of the situation and maintain the ceasefire. Second question, what strategy could be uh, chosen to remove the obstacles uh, uh, in the way of organizing a referendum? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then I'll have a brief question from uh, Iran. Um, and you can unmute yourself, uh, I think. Um, and uh, I also see a brief question from uh, Senator McFedrin. And then I, unfortunately, I will have to, to cut this off so that we can, the questions off so that we can get back to our um, participants. So I do see Iran, if you can unmute yourself, please, and pose your question. Um, I see that uh, somebody from Burundi has opened their microphone as well. Uh, I'm just going to mute here. Uh, all right. I do not see, uh, I do not hear the person from Iran. If you could open your microphone. There you are. Okay. Sir, you have the floor. Mr. Razakhan, do you have a question or comment? Sir? Uh, we're not hearing you. I'll go to Senator McFedrin while you uh, sort out your microphone. Sorry. 
Senator McFedrin. Thank you very much, Patty, and thank you. Senator McFedrin. Thank you. Did you want me to proceed? Yes. Thank you. It's, actu it's actually a quick question um, to any of the panelists, and that is one of the issues, of course, plaguing any program, and the peace building is no different, is an assessment of the effectiveness of the interventions and the investments. I think it's fair to say that we have a lot of concern about what we see with re, what would be called regression back towards away from peace agreements that were brokered and assisted by previous investments. Uh, if I could have uh, um, hopefully some assurance from panelists that um, this, is, this is being closely monitored. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McFedrin. I'll now turn to Mr. 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 Namoyende, you don't lose time. The family. Okay. Namoyende, you don't lose time. Sir, please go ahead. I'm the family. Namoyende, you don't. Most of the show are not finished, David. Sir, perhaps you can type your question into the chat. Can you type the question, please? Um, sure. Okay. Sure. So, do you hear me? If you're not, I can, I can yes, type I it. I hear you. Thank you. Okay, good. So, I have uh, just a brief question. Um, my question is that um, it's about five years that the Saudi Arabia invaded Yemen. And you know, we know that um, more than 100,000 people are killed there. And we know that, you know, uh, the kids are, um, they have, the kids have some, some major problems in Yemen. And my question is that how we can help to stop this war, you know, because it's, um, I mean, it's very bad for the people in the Yemen because, you know, they, they are starving and they have many problems and, you know, we have the COVID-19 problem over there. So uh, it's, it would be very good if we can find a solution for stopping this war. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to mute you again. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now turn to the panelists. Uh, um, perhaps you can raise your hand as to who would like to go first to answer any of those questions. Um, given the time, we're gonna have to have you answer any of those questions and also give your concluding remarks at the same time, if that's possible. Um, uh, I'm looking at our two ambassadors. Uh, would one of you like to go first? Uh, Ambassador Mula Mula, please. Uh, just tap, to, there you go. Uh, if you can just unmute, sorry. Okay. There. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for okay. those uh, good questions. I missed some of them because of the, I was trying to follow the French. I don't have the interpretation, but uh, I think that question was directed to Oscar. <laughs> so for me in general, let me just address uh, what Senator McFadden has, has said. Uh, which is quite pertinent, even as a group of uh, eminent persons, we were really concerned to see that uh, the money that is invested or the money that is put into the, for example, in the uh, peace building fund, that it, it is used wisely, but also it is used in terms of uh, inclusiveness, that uh, the people, the beneficiaries are involved in terms of the design of the, of the projects, of the programs and implementation. Mm -hmm. So that way, when you talk of accountability, it is you, those who are benefiting, they will be accountable for something that they know. <laughs> so I, I don't know that I can give you the assurance because I was also on the other, on the other side of who, wanting to ask more questions on, <laughs> on how this investment here and there, but uh, I just want to assure you that uh, this was also an area of focus. And uh, the good thing that we have Oscar in the room, it is one of the funds that so far has been getting rate, rated A's every time. <laughs> I think it is, it is well managed. It's only that the resources are, are not uh, predictable when they are not enough. Um, about the COVID-19, yes, 
I think we have all learned one lesson. One which for me, I always take as a, a silver lining of this COVID-19, that prevention works. That if you invest in prevention, and this at the individual level, the state take, assuming the responsibility to ensure that they protect their citizens, their populations. I think this is one of the, the good things that came out of COVID. But also the realization that COVID has brought out the, some of the challenges that are, were overlooked, and especially when you, are, you see the UN system, institutions, organizations working in fragmented way. So now I think this is a call, and this is what also the purpose of this review, to see how even the UN system can work together in addressing a common problem. That you cannot say this is purely humanitarian, but you see what starts as a humanitarian problem is affects also peace and security. So this the approach of integrated manner in addressing the issues of the consequence of, of um, COVID-19 pandemic is also uh, a good, maybe a good well, beginning or a good start of working that we need to work together, not in a fragmented way to be able to address the common challenges. So this is what I could say. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mula Mula. Uh, Ms. O'Neill? Thanks. I agree completely on that, and we'll speak to COVID as well. And as uh, Madame Felekna has pointed out, you know, she asked what lessons we're learning. And um, I've, I've stopped using the term lessons learned often because I think we need to say lessons observed because I don't know that we, I think it's all of our job to make sure we've collectively actually learned them and integrated them in our system. And so exactly as the ambassador just said, prevention works, no fragmentation, and therefore our responses have to be integrated as well. So I think we've seen that what was started as a health crisis has significant peace and security implications. So it's exacerbated every form of exclusion um, and, and discrimination that we know of. And we know that exclusion can be at the heart of conflict. We know that there are all kinds of secondary and tertiary issues that we're looking at, like all the children out of school, the majority of kids who go back will be boys. So the majority who are who stay at home are women and, and girls. And we're already seeing rates of child marriage, of early pregnancy, uh, of recruitment into armed groups of kids who are out of school, et cetera. So we really just need to make sure that our responses are also informed by that. So if women are the majority of people in the informal economy, how are we ensuring that stimulus packages or government support reaches them? And how do we deal with this digital divide issue where Yes, we're all meeting online. We have more meetings like this, which is great because we can participate from around the world. But there's also still a significant portion of many more women than men who do not have access to the internet, to phone, to reliable service, et cetera. And we have to make sure we're not leaving them behind uh, in our response. So I, I agree with that. And I think um, we need to be as attentive to the dynamics that we learned in analyzing uh, what caused the, the situation to be so bad, as well as what we can do to actually um, deal with it over time. And I think the peace building infrastructure in the UN actually brings together rarely um, many of the, the fragmented groups in other senses. So I think it's extra important to our global response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador O'Neill. Oscar? Yes, thank you. I mean, just to agree with uh, the, the, my, my colleague briefers here, uh, I think extremely important and pertinent for the IPU is the fact that what we are seeing in real time is this huge, huge erosion of trust in institutions, in political institutions, public institutions. Um, this is the time to be responsive. And when we talk about inclusivity, when we talk about dialogue, when we talk about putting people at the center, if this is not what people are seeing coming from these institutions, these institutions uh, will be vanishing very, very fast in terms of the trust. So the, the, the aspect of erosion of trust is, I think, one of the most important concerns that we have, basically, as, a, as an intergovernmental mechanism that seeks to build uh, institutionality, that seeks to build inclusive institutions as part of a core mandate of the SDGs. And this uh, legitimate inclusive institutions are being eroded by the behavior and the messaging and the reaction in terms of uh, delayed times and confused messaging. It is also exacerbating inequalities at a tremendous rate. And 
pulling millions of people into poverty overnight. Uh, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave, you start seeing and particularly impacted are women and young people, particularly because the big burden of exclusion, the big um, loss in jobs and employment, and the huge task that is falling on women is everything that the institutions are not doing. It's taking care of the family, it's taking care of the education of the children, as, as institutions are unable to provide in the context of COVID-19. So what is, so the question was raised, so what is, what do we do and how, how serious is this? And I think here is extremely important to introduce the notion that as we prepare packages of COVID-19 response, that the way we finance the response actually factors in conflict sensitivity, that we actually look to see which communities have been marginalized, excluded, not responded to. Because what we're also seeing in many places is that a lot of the responses are very capital-based, where the centers of institutions are. But in the regions, in the border areas, in the rural communities, there's very little support and assistance because either of the lack of presence of institutions, but just of the lack of reach, which is compromised uh, this, this, this COVID. So important in the response, because parliaments are in the business of formulating responses and resourcing them, is the importance of conflict sensitivity, the importance of inclusion, the importance of integration, to see how all these, how health, education, jobs, uh, dialogue, social protection, how is the social protection mechanism being strengthened and in what order? And flexibility, because we are not seeing the type of flexibility that is required to uh, sort of go to this response. So um, important here, and something that hasn't been mentioned, but again, where parliaments play a huge role. There might not be the trillions and billions of dollars uh, that some uh, advanced and wealthy nations have in terms of budget response and we're seeing the inequality in terms of uh, fiscal response in terms of uh, microeconomic response etc the money is going uh, to many many countries that can afford to actually put packages of social protection but in this pandemic not to lose sight of the hugely detrimental effect that hate speech and stigmatization is provoking this is another virus. This is another force multiplier of COVID-19. And here, parliamentarians have a crucial role to stand up, to speak up, and to bring science and facts into the debate. This is maybe even more important than the money that can flow to the social protection mechanisms in many countries. How leaders are addressing the issue of inclusivity, of national responses that put people at the center of the response is hugely important. And several questions were raised. I think at the core, and as Ambassador Liberata uh, uh, stated and Jacqueline O'Neill, at the core of how we're able to create solidarity, uh, which is another hugely important part of the work of IPU, of the work of the UN, is how to build trust, how to bring cooperation and coordination. So on the aspects of how we work, for example, with organizations such as the ICRC, hugely important because first and foremost, this has become a health crisis, it has become a humanitarian crisis, the humanitarian agencies are deploying. It is amazing that <clears throat> in many places in the world, the UN has stayed to deliver. When many, many organizations have packed and left, the UN stayed and delivered and continues to work hand in hand with national authorities and the many civil society and NGOs that are still working. So I think in terms of the cooperation, it has been as outstanding. I think the work that is required is to precisely know how interventions are coordinated as sequenced. So when we talk about the humanitarian development, peace building nexus and the linkages to, human, uh, to, to, to humanitarian response, it is about addressing the drivers of what is provoking the displacement, the protracted conflict. Uh, so issues of durable solutions, for example, how IDPs and refugees and how hosting populations are able to absorb and, and how governments are able to respond with solidarity and respect 
forces all of us to have to work together in a very integrated manner, but with the respect of who is doing what. So I think this notion of coherence, extremely important as the concept of peace building and the importance of the UN to work in partnership with the many, many other actors that have flourished in this field since the establishment of the UN 75 years ago. And there were uh, <coughs> allusions to the importance of the ongoing missions on the ground. Um, I think it's extremely important that this Secretary General has deployed personal envoys, peacekeeping operations, special political missions. Their role is to be engaged in mediation efforts. Uh, peace building is fundamentally a national, a national endeavor, and we are here to support those national efforts that bring peace. Peace cannot be imposed. Uh, they cannot be ex imported, if you will. They need to be built, and many times need to be built bottom up through inclusion, through the participation of women, through the participation of young people, um, through the participation of those voices that are not included in many of the peace agreements. Uh, on that issue, the fund, a hugely important mechanism, because one of the things we're finding, and I'm sure the parliament sees this uh, very often, uh, it's once we have the so-called handshake deal agreement, a peace agreement, a signature of an accord, it is quite important, it is quite interesting to see the delay in action and the delay in funding that actually starts unraveling many of these peace agreements. So the peace building fund has been a crucial ingredient. And I will give you the latest example in the Central African Republic, when 14 rebel groups signed a peace agreement with the government, the most important aspect of the agreements, the transitional justice, support to the victims, the establishment of mixed security unit needed somebody to jumpstart those process. And that was the peace building fund. While other donors and the government puts together its budget and its resources, this instrument is essential to prevent relapse, to actually strengthen the ownership of these agreements and to expand it. And to the, to the, to the question of the peace building commission, again, uh, the work was initially focused on six configurations. Um, there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, maybe one of the success stories is actually the, 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 the configuration that has been chaired by Canada, Sierra Leone, that has recently graduated out of the mechanism of the configuration. And this required, and this is key, that peace building is not like a humanitarian response action. Peace building requires a medium and long-term focus. This is as, as, as uh, you know, there, there's two big problems of peace building. One, the need to of sustain political attention to the political solutions that are hammered out, but do require the solidarity and the diplomatic platform that the Peace Building Commission can do. And this diplomatic platform, extremely important because it shines a light, but it allows to bring the key actors to work together and to mobilize the resources, which are not just financial, it's political support, it's sub-regional support, it's the mobilization of other mechanisms that the UN can actually help deploy. So there, there are success stories. Um, and one of the biggest success stories is that the commission no longer just works through country configurations. We've had more than 18 cases of other countries coming to the commission to actually help explain their peace building strategies, such was the case with Sri Lanka, such was the case with Kyrgyzstan, such was the case with Colombia, um, Papua New Guinea, and the list goes on. These are countries that are not in a configuration setting, but are countries who are undergoing important national peace building uh, endeavors that warrant this international solidarity to share the lessons learned. So this South-South, uh, north south east west cooperation if you will between continents much like the ipu is hugely important because we can learn from other processes and we can actually introduce uh, concepts certainly the colombia peace process benefited immensely from the irish peace process from the peace processes that were happening in mali and sudan this persistent exclusion of women as a lessons learned was something that the colombian negotiators had to factor in and the issue of the victims upfront, which is something that's usually relegated to the last thing. And that's usually the issue that unravels many of these peace agreements. I mean, there's a lot to say, but just to uh, say, I really appreciated the questions. I couldn't always hear all of them, but uh, thank you, Patty, for this opportunity.
No, thank you, Oscar, for joining us today and spending uh, your time, but also your passion. Um, it comes through loud and clear, and we're very glad that you're there. Um, I, I do see Laurence uh, uh, Marzel, who d works with our committee, the IPU Committee on Peace and International Security. They've been doing a lot of work on 1325, for instance, um, and so uh, and our gender team as well. So the, these are issues that are very, as you say, at the heart of uh, the IPU and our work on parliamentary diplomacy. Um, and hopefully we'll get back to being able to have in-person meetings and to have uh, many more discussions within an assembly and, uh, and resolutions, um, as you mentioned, that are, are so important. So hopefully we'll have all of you back, um, Ambassador Mulamula and Ambassador O'Neill, um, and you, uh, Oscar Fernandez Taranko, who uh, all of you have been absolutely terrific. And we thank everyone for participating in this briefing, we hope that the technology will allow us to uh, post to the recording. Um, and um, if anyone, um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a series of briefings that the New York office is putting together um, over the next year. And uh, we will uh, entertain your ideas for uh, different topics, but um, the next one will be on Security Council reform, which I think will be uh, very important as well. We hope to do that in January. So thank all of you for your work on these issues. And thank you so much to our three presenters today um, for inspiring us and, uh, and helping parliamentarians know what to look out for when they're having these debates in parliament uh, and when they're reviewing budgets uh, and other things. Um, and when they're building peace with, uh, within their own country and with their neighbors. So thank you all very much for joining us today and uh, we wish you a, a good day and, and stay safe, please. Um, and thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Big pleasure. Thank you.